The next time I saw her, it was at a bid meeting for SMU University in Dallas, Texas. They were planning to build a new dormitory. Let me say this, when it comes to the city of Dallas, major players come to the table. Big money. Frankly, I didn't expect us to do well at all with this bid. In fact, I figured it was all just a formality that one of the alumni would get the contract, so I started working the angle to get subcontract work. What I mean by this is I was at the meeting to network and sell our services. I didn't give a damn about the bid itself. Well, in walks Vanessa Hemrick. When I tell you that this woman's presence dominated a room, it was like when she came in the door, every man and woman was attracted to her, all attention was on her. So much so to the point that the presenter paused and said that heaven must have sent an angel. However, this woman was no angel at all, and you will understand what I mean in a moment. Remember, I was reading to you the scriptures about the great whore of Babylon and the buying and selling of souls. I think it's about time I explain to you how that is done. All souls belong to God, for he created man as a three-part being. Man has spirit, soul, and flesh. It is through the flesh that the spirit is corrupted and brought into partnership with other spirits that corrupt the soul, and eventually, when the person is in the right place, their soul is traded based on the level of corruption or the person themselves decides to sell their own soul for riches and wealth. People often quote Mark 8:36, but they leave out verses 35 and 37. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? The human soul is priceless, so when a witch or a sorcerer can corrupt a soul and trade it for power and wealth, they can demand many things. Usually the deals are for 101 souls. That extra one is a family member or friend. The more wealth and power you want, the more souls you have to corrupt. Okay, now that you understand the story. Ms. Hemrick walks into the room, and the air seems to leave the room as she sits down. When the break time comes and people start to mingle, she has a crowd around her, and it's like people are drawn to her. I'm standing there watching this, and she keeps peeking over at me, then invites me over into the crowd. What she does next was so subtle I almost didn't catch it. She says, Gentlemen, let me introduce you to one of the top contract hounds in the nation, pointing to me. As they turn to look, the Holy Spirit says, Reject everything she says right now. Then she says, This guy has been outbidding our company for the past 12 months. He is amazing. And you know that means a lot coming from me. On top of that, they get the work done. A blanket endorsement and a good one at that. However, understand, Satan has no problem with good. He has a problem with God. However, in the split second I was caught off guard, my words stumble, and then the Holy Spirit speaks and says, Gentlemen, such gracious words from a beautiful woman. One would think that they are all true, and some of them may be. However, I'm just a little fish in a big pond. I only go after the contracts that Jesus wants, everything else I ignore. That turns the conversation quickly as a man says, Jesus doesn't need money, and starts to laugh. And I say, you're right, he doesn't, but his followers need jobs and health care. The look on her face when she realized something designed to make me become prideful and bring me not only into agreement with her, but put me in debt to her failed, it was clear that she was upset. The way she cut her eyes, it was obvious. Well, we go back into the meeting, and afterward there is a networking event, and the guys are all over her. She has the pick of the litter as I come to the men, but she decides to come over and sit with me. Now, there are very few words to explain how this woman made you feel. There was this animal attraction to her, and she knew it. When she sat across from me, I could feel it, and it was intense. I decided to ask her about J.C., and when I do, I say, So, where is my buddy J.C.? He is normally at these events. She says, J.C. is around. He is working out some issues. I'm taking his place until he gets things resolved. What kind of things? I ask, and she says, Well, he is having issues with family. He needs to focus on the things that are important. Then she shifts the conversation to me, asking questions about my wife. So, how long have you been married? She says, and I redirect that question and spin it around, asking, I find it hard to believe a beautiful woman such as yourself is not married. All these powerful, wealthy men and no one has scooped you up yet. 
This tennis match goes back and forth between the two of us for about 15 minutes before we are interrupted by one of the wealthiest men in Dallas, who interrupts and hits on her. She looks at me and says, Excuse me, looks like you might have talked up a husband for me. He laughs at her, she smiles, and then the two of them disappear into the crowd. I worked the room for another 30 minutes, then headed into the hotel lobby, where she was sitting on a sofa talking to him. She gave me this seductive glance, and for a second, there was this sparkle over her face. I knew in that moment she was going to sleep with that man. What I didn't expect was what happened when I went to sleep. As I went to sleep, it was dark and I was resting. And the next thing I knew, I was back in the hotel lobby, and she was there sitting on the sofa with no clothes on, surrounded by men. Looking at her, it was like they were worshipping her beauty. Out of all the men, she was calling out to me to come. Now, I have told you all about the realm of dreams and how it is a real dimension, and I'm aware of this. So I wake myself up. I'm up for a split second, and it's like I'm pulled back into the dream. I'm back in the lobby again, and she is still beckoning me to come to her. So I wake myself up again. This time, when I wake up, I rebuke the dream and any spiritual exchanges made in the dream that are not of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Then I fall back asleep and I'm in the lobby, but this time I'm above the crowd. It's like I'm floating out of her range. She's looking up at me and then gets angry and turns her attention to another man in the room. That dream fades into me walking outside and talking with some men whose faces I could not see, but it's like we are crossing at a crosswalk and this guy has this amazing pinstriped suit on with blue pinstripes. All of a sudden, a car turns the corner and hits him. Then I wake up. There was a breakfast for everyone at 8.30 a.m., so I head downstairs to get breakfast, and looking around, Ms. Hemrick is not there. We eat, and they make another presentation, and then we adjourn, and they want us to take a look at another dormitory and do a walkthrough of the building. What happened next was crazy. I went to the bathroom, and when I'm at the urinal, this Frank Sinatra song started to play. Now, this entire time I have been at this hotel and conference center, there has been zero music playing. The song Witchcraft by Frank Sinatra starts to play. And as I'm washing my hands, it's like I start to have deja vu. I'm walking out the door, and as I get towards the front door to the hotel, up walks another group of men from the conference, and one of them had this amazing suit, and he has the most beautiful blue pinstripes in the suite. If you've ever encountered deja vu, you know it kind of unfolds, and you remember what you have seen before. Well, that is what was happening. We are walking, and we go to cross the street, and he is right in front of me. I knew in that moment this was my dream coming true, so I stop him, tapping him on the shoulder, and ask him where he is from. He turns and looks and says that he is from Houston. As the word Houston is coming out of his mouth, this car comes flying around the corner and he is within arm's reach and I pull him out of the way. The look on his face is like he's freaking out and I just keep walking. He is standing there in the same spot, digesting what just happened to him. When we get to the dormitory, he walks up to me and says thanks for the help and then just starts to talk about how he checked in late last night to the hotel for the event, and it's been strange. He had a dream about this woman in the hotel lobby, and he stops, you know, like what he was about to say was too crazy for me to understand. I simply tell him, yeah, Dallas is a strange place. We walk into the door to the dormitory, and Ms. Hemrick is standing there, and he looks like he has seen a ghost. He grabs me by my arm and freaks out, saying that is the woman from his dream. Then he turns and walks out. The Holy Spirit tells me to go after him, so I go out the door, and he is standing there looking like a deer in headlights. What's your name, sir? He tells me his name is Jeremiah. I tell him, listen, that dream, I had it too. You are not crazy, and this is the woman from the dream. As we are talking, she walks out the door, almost as if she could hear us talking about her, and she says, Guys, the tour is starting. You are going to miss it. Jeremiah and I go back towards the building, and she is holding the door open. I insist that she go in before us and hold the door for her, and she just looks at me and says, Out of all the men here, you truly are a gentleman in every way. Then she walks in. As I'm going in the door, 
it's just translated to me in my spirit that this woman has been trying every man here in every dimension of reality, and she has yet to figure out how to deal with me. As we are walking down the hallway, Jeremiah hands me his business card, and it turns out he is a pastor representing a nonprofit organization. This was how Pastor Jeremiah and I met. He would be the person to help me utterly destroy the power that Ms. Hemrick had accumulated with her magic, power, and control. Control over men unlike anything I had ever seen.